Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Baldrige Foundation's quarterly webinar series. As a reminder, due to the high number of participants, everyone will be kept on mute during the presentations. If you have questions, please submit them to the moderator in the questions box located on your control screen. Presenters will answer questions at the end of each presentation. Here is today's agendas. Our featured guest is George Taylor, President and Managing Partner of Beyond Feedback. George will be talking to us today about their Baldridge Aligned Employee Engagement Survey process. As you may remember, a 2018 Malcolm Baldridge National Quality Award recipient, Larry Potterfield of Midway USA, talked about Beyond Feedback and the exceptional work that they did in assisting their company. Following George's presentation, we will take questions and then we will proceed to an update from the foundation, the Baldrige program from Bob Fangmeyer, and the Alliance for Performance Excellence from the chair, Brian Lassiter. At that time, we will take any last final questions and we'll have a few closing remarks. So now it is a privilege for me to introduce Mr. George Taylor. George, thank you for being with us here today. Thank you so much, Al. Uh, it's an honor to be here with you and everyone uh, that's joining online. Uh, we are uh, honored and proud to be partnered with the uh, Baldrige Foundation and look forward to introducing everyone to some of our uh, capabilities and unique approaches to what we've done with some uh, Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award uh, national recipients. Let's go to the next slide here. Our uh, mission as an organization is, is really to deliver actionable insights to let directly from our clients' most important stakeholders, really to drive continuous improvement for them uh, on both a strategic and an operational level. Uh, we uh, really have a vision uh, across our organization of being the most recommended uh, type of organization in, in our space and uh, have the highest client retention rate in the U.S. Uh, we currently have a 100 net promoter score for three years running among our clients and are uh, proud and honored uh, to have that uh, and, and work every day hard to, to earn that. Uh, we're, we're very driven by a set of values that we hold very deeply. Uh, you see some of them listed here, honesty, integrity, servant leadership, uh, perseverance, kind of working through issues and obstacles, uh, teamwork that we have internally. Um, excellence is, is the starting point for our standard of performance internally here. Uh, stewardship of our resources, uh, being data-driven, and, and really being innovative in all that we do. I, I mentioned our partnership with the Baldrige Foundation that we've had for a number of years now and, and have been proud to be connected with them. Uh, we are also one of the founding partners of an organization called the Customer Experience Professionals Association, um, an organization focused on the customer engagement side of things and then also with the uh, Society of Human Resources Management, the, the SHRM organization who just had their uh, large national conference in Las Vegas this week with about 22,000 attendees uh, there. So let, let's uh, focus today's conversation really as, as Al introduced on a unique approach to employee engagement and satisfaction. Uh, we were uh, excited and delighted a, a number of years ago to, to get introduced to Larry Potterfield and the Midway USA organization uh, they were really visionaries and innovators around this approach, and uh, you, you'll see that they were recipients of the award in 2010 and 2015, and, and then we've got kind of a question mark there, which is just an homage to, to Larry and his passion around uh, you know, receiving the award. Again, it's certainly not intended to be presumptuous, uh, but, but I know that they are a very passionate group about uh, the whole Baldridge uh, approach to managing and leading their organization. Uh, Larry and his team came to us a number of years ago and, and said, hey, we, we have kind of a different approach to uh, employee engagement and satisfaction, and we can't find a vendor out there that, that gets this or, or understands this. And uh, between my uh, past experience and history with, uh, with uh, the Paul Bridge organization and, and what you all do and uh, my own uh, Lean Six Sigma black belt background and, and things like that, th this was a natural for us to say, hey, we, we get that and we understand that and, and certainly want to uh, partner with you on that. I also wanted to uh, to recognize a few other uh, national recipients, Mid-America Transplant, uh, Freese and Nichols, and uh, Alta Schools, which many of you may know better as the Charter School of San Diego. Uh, also recent recipients who, who have been earlier adopters of this approach and, and have really helped us in many ways to kind of refine it and, and, 
and take you know the, the good work that, that we did originally with uh, Midway USA and, and kind of adapt it a little bit to some other organizations' needs. I, I also would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, CORE out of uh, Pittsburgh, the uh, Center for Organ Replacement and Education. Uh, that they've been an early adopter as well, as well as several other organizations, but, but CORE has also been uh, you know, very instrumental in kind of thinking, helping us think about it differently and, and try different approaches to, uh, to building this for their organization. So let, let's go to the next page here and, and I'll outline at a high level what this is all about. Uh, when we talk about employee engagement and satisfaction surveys, I, I know Larry Potterfield jokes that everybody hates them, uh, but, but we, we really want uh, them to be a great experience for your employees uh, as well as for the leadership to, to get some great insight. And in order to do that, it has to be much more than just running a survey. It's got to be, first of all, customized to your organization. It's got to really fit sort of the DNA of, of what you do and, and how you operate. Um, it has to have uh, robust reporting and analytics down to individual segment levels of the workforce. Again, thinking of the criteria around workforce engagement and, and the need to kind of segment and identify the key drivers of engagement and satisfaction down at that individual segment level. And then you really need a process that sits around this, not, not only to design the, the survey instrument and the reporting and, and those analytics, but also a process around communication uh, internally inside the organization, uh, a, a process around action planning that, that sits at multiple different levels inside the organization, uh, and, and you know, really a process around the whole structure. You see. Uh, an image of that on the right-hand side of the screen here, really digging into root causes, uh, linking engagement data to other important data elements and kind of integrating that data across your organization, uh, action planning and prioritizing those items, uh, designing those improvements, and, and then continuing that feedback cycle so that as an organization, you continue to get better uh, you know, with, with your employees. And, and, and we're so passionate about this because we know as the Baldrige framework outlines that the, the experience of your employees ultimately drives the experience of your customers. And the experience of your customers ultimately drives your outcomes as an organization and, and your performance levels. And so uh, we, we really work hard to kind of connect those dots and, and work with our clients to uh, you know, drive their performance, but it all starts upstream with the interactions that they have every day with their employees. So let's break this survey down a little bit and, and show you the various steps that are involved in participating in the survey from the perspective of the employee as, as they're going through the survey. Let's go to the next page here and we'll talk about step one. So step one in this whole process is that the employee will select a set of key requirements that from their perspective most drive their own engagement and satisfaction. And this is a really unique and really uh, innovative approach to an employee engagement survey. Many of you may have experienced uh, engagement surveys where there are 100 questions and it takes 30 minutes to complete and it's just onerous and, and painful for the employee. Uh, the, the approach that we use here uh, really is oriented around key constructs inside the Baldrige criteria like key requirements of employees, employee key requirements or EKRs as we refer to them. So the employees presented with a set of EKRs or employee key requirements to select, they can select as many as they'd like um, and, and those that they don't select, uh, really what, what that's identifying is that those just are not items that, that for them drive their engagement satisfaction. There's also an opportunity here as a, from a continuous improvement process uh, perspective for them to add additional key requirements in the future. Uh, so, so perhaps there's a, a key requirement that's missing from their perspective. This gives them an opportunity to add some additional thoughts around that for future survey cycles. Now, as they select these key requirements, it's obviously kicking off a lot of really interesting data right away. If I'm a hospital, let's say, I, I can quickly kind of identify what are my nursing staff's key requirements versus what are my uh, in, environmental services staff or my housekeeping or or uh, even food service staff's key requirements. So, so they're identifying them themselves. And then as they go further into the process of participating in the survey, those key requirements that they've selected here in step one are all that they are asked about from this point on in the survey. So that's a very unique approach as well to identify, you know, here are my key requirements. 
And now from this point on in the survey, this is all I'm going to be asked about. I'm only being asked about those things that I've identified personally as the key elements that are driving my engagement and satisfaction. Let's go to the next page and I'll show you step two of this process. So after they have selected those key requirements, you can see here it's been narrowed down now to those items that they've individually selected, those key requirements that are most driving their satisfaction. What we ask them to do in the second step is to weigh these against each other. So, so you've identified, let's say in this example, six different key requirements for you. Now, which of those are kind of number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, number six, uh, and, and weight them relative to each other. So it gives the uh, employee, again, an opportunity to apply their own weighting to them, which again, from a driver analysis perspective and what you're trying to do in terms of really measuring that, that level of engagement satisfaction, um, gives you some great insight into what's really you know, proportionally weighted uh, by different segments of my workforce. So I can see, uh, again, I'll go back to my hospital example, uh, nursing and, and how maybe even different floors of nursing weigh these differently um, or how nursing in general in, in aggregate weigh these differently than some other uh, segments of the workforce. Let's go to the next page. And in step three of this process, uh, back one, there we go. In step three of this process, the employee will weigh, will score these key requirements now that they've uh, identified and weighed uh, in terms of how they feel the organization is doing it, meeting those key requirements. There are a couple really interesting elements going on on this screen that, that you're seeing. One of which is that uh, in contrast to traditional five point scale types of engagement surveys, we're using a 100 point sliding scale here. So the employee can literally slide that, that slider back and forth on the screen and give the organization a score anywhere from zero to 100. Why do we do that? Why is that important? Well, we'll here with some of the learning that we had in working with Midway USA, as well as some of these other very high performing uh, Baldrige recipient types of organizations, is that internally the mindset of the employees, the psychology of them was that we're never perfect. We're, we're never a 100. Um, and so I, I can't sort of in good conscience give us a five out of five if this were a traditional five point scale type of survey. I can't say we're a five out of five because, gosh, you know, even when we're really high performing, we're, we've still got room to improve and to grow. And, and, and so what we've learned is that so we can't be a five out of five. I also don't feel confident sort of giving us a four out of five, right? Uh, four out of five would be sort of the equivalent of an 80. That sounds like a B and, and gosh, we're not a B organization. So, so what we found is this 100 point slider scale really gives what we call in the survey research business more scoring discrimination for the employee to really dig in and say, you know, we're not 100, but we're not an 80. We're an 82 or we're an 83 or you know, we're an 85 or wherever we're at kind of on that spectrum. And certainly we get some low scores in certain areas as well. Now, as the employee is sliding that scale back and forth, the screen is dynamically updating up where it says your current score, 91.65%. It's dynamically updating their individual engagement and satisfaction score. Again, a unique feature where the employee can actually get live feedback about how, how the system is sort of scoring their engagement based on the weightings that they've applied and the scores that they've applied. And the third item that you'll see on here is that we've in, in included the opportunity to comment relative to that specific key requirement uh, in the context of scoring that key requirement. So if I've selected appropriate amount of time of, of work and time away from work uh, for my position as a key requirement, um, we on the right hand side, there would be a, a notice there that says uh, what could be improved, what, what would improve your satisfaction engagement around this key requirement. You can see some typical comments that would be written in there by the employee. Uh, you, you might imagine that we get a lot of commentary there from employees, detailed uh, comments about exactly what needs to happen and why is that? It, it really is because at the heart of this, it's an employee centered kind of approach to engagement where the employee is selecting those items that are most important to them, they clearly have an opinion about what could be improved about them. Even, even when they're performing really well, uh, the, the employee will still have ideas about what could be done because these are key requirements for them as an individual. 
So the, the process really engages the employee in the process of identifying and helping to measure the level of engagement and performance for the organization. We'll go to the next slide. And uh, the, the last step in this process is that we also give the employee an opportunity to just make some general comments about the organization. So uh, in step four, uh, some that, that may not be specific to an uh, employee key requirement. You know, are there other things that we could do to make the organization better? Um, and, and then again, kind of give the employee some opportunity to provide that feedback. As those responses are coming into our system, we provide our, our uh, clients with full visibility into the participation rates in real time so they know uh, how the participation rate is tracking by different segments of the workforce. Um, they're able to go in and, and uh, adjust and, and work with their teams to communicate you know, participation and, and help them all get aligned and, and on board. Let's go to the next slide and uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the other elements of this. The uh, analysis and reporting I mentioned is, is very critical. So when we get all those responses in, uh, we give our clients all of the data back within five business days of the close of that survey. They have all of the data back into their system so that they can start looking at that data. And we do that in a number of different ways. On the left-hand side of the screen, you're seeing uh, a dashboard tool that allows our clients to go in and slice and dice the data any way that they want to. Uh, by different demographic variables to look at the scores of different departments or different tenured employees or different uh, groups within the organization. We create a, a variety of different heat map charts and trending charts and down at the bottom, even driver analysis that identifies for a specific segment of the workforce, what's most driving their engagement and, and how does that, uh, the, the, the two by two grid there is really a continuous improvement grid it helps you identify where are we underperforming, that's further to the left, versus where are we overperforming, that's further to the right, uh, and then how much is, is that particular key requirement a driver? You know, so closer to the top of the chart there uh, is a bigger driver, closer to the bottom of the chart, uh, less of a driver. So, so they can quickly identify what are the one or two critical to quality items that we need to focus on to really improve that employee experience uh, going forward. And then as you can imagine, over time, once we tackle that item, other items tend to surface as the next kind of innovation to improve the organization going forward. On the bottom right-hand side of the screen here, you'll see that it's not enough to just have this reporting sitting inside of uh, an HR department somewhere. We're, we're big advocates and believers that to really go beyond just collecting a lot of feedback data, you need to get that data out in the hands of the individuals who can actually work with it and use it. And so in the bottom right corner, what you're seeing is a depiction of a manager level dashboard. So we build these at the team or segment level. We also build them all the way down to the individual manager level. So an individual manager can see the results of that, his or her, uh, that, that manager's team uh, in totality and, and again, kind of action plan against those results specifically rather than some generic data that's at a total corporate or aggregated level. And then in the upper right uh, of this page, you're seeing an example of the kind of analysis that our team does. So in addition to giving you some great tools for you to go and, and extract data yourself anytime you want to, uh, our team culls through all of the data, our team of experience analysts, and we'll pull out what we see is the key insights, the, the key drivers. Uh, we'll analyze all of the commentary that, that we received. Uh, we sentiment score those. We uh, categorize and theme those. We make recommendations. We provide benchmarking norms on all of those data points. So lots that we do then to, to really package that into reports that are easily consumable uh, inside of your organization to uh, take action. Let's go to the next slide. And uh, I mentioned benchmarking and normative data. We, we, this is certainly for uh, Baldridge uh, aspirees, kind of an important um, component of all of this. And there are a number of things that we do here, and, and we, we look at this in, in two levels. One, we think it's really, really important to have what we call internal normative data or internal benchmarking data. Uh, why is that? Well, well here's, here's why is that when you start to roll this data out to managers, if you show them some external data point, it's easy for managers to dismiss that data point and say, well, that's a Google, or that's an Apple, or that's an Amazon, we're not them, right? Or whatever their sort of argument is. 
But when we create internal benchmarks of, let's say, the top quartile manager ratings or the bottom quartile manager ratings or the top engagement teams or top, you know, the sort of internal quartiles or quintiles of groups, it gives them something that matches their workplace environment identically and gives them comparisons within the organization that aren't just mean or sort of average comparisons, but here are the top performers inside the organization and how you compare to them. So that's a really important piece. On the external benchmarking side, we, we certainly don't neglect that and certainly think it's a, a very important component of all of this. Uh, we have several different usages or, or applications there. Certainly, uh, we have started to build a, a pretty robust database of uh, National Quality Award recipients um, and, and using this methodology of, of survey data. And I'll add to that to tell you that part of our vision for 2019 and 2020 is to become the, the uh, resource for organizations that are either applying for Baldridge at the state uh, regional level or even at the national level, uh, become a resource where they can access benchmarking data around employee engagement and satisfaction, around customer engagement and satisfaction. Uh, so we are rolling out some uh, initiatives later this year to, to start to work on that. And when, when I say that, um, it's not just, uh, it's not that they have to be our clients. Rather, our, our goal is to build a repository of data, uh, whether they're working with us or they're working with some other survey vendor, uh, but, but to start to create a repository that, that can be a resource for uh, applicants throughout the country. The, the second source of uh, external benchmark data that we have is we have a panel of 50 million employees across the world and across a wide variety of industries that we're able to slice and segment down to match your industry and your organization size. Um, and, and then we field that, that, uh, that panel that we've selected and screened down. We field a survey to them in parallel with your organization survey. So, so what does all that mean? What it means is that when we get an external benchmark, not only are we perfectly matching your industry and, and profile, we're also matching the time frame in which your survey was run, meaning there's not a data latency issue here of maybe external benchmarking data that's three or four years old. The data was collected at the same time in the same economic conditions and environment as uh, your organization. Let's go to the next slide here. Um, action planning really needs to happen on a lot of different levels. It, it, it's not enough to just you know, declare one item and, and, and say, call that a day. We think it's really important to do employee focus group sessions where uh, employee, you can clarify insights with employees, explain the reasons why things are, and, and help employees recognize that they have accountability for driving engagement as well. Uh, Matt Fleming, the president at Midway USA, uh, does a phenomenal job with, with this process, and he actually leads these focus group sessions himself and hears directly from the frontline employees uh, what they have to say. We also think it's really important to uh, identify uh, individual managers' uh, improvements that they can make with their teams in the form of kind of workshops, and, and those workshops could be with their team or just with the manager, and we can help facilitate those as well as help facilitate action planning at a leadership level where you identify, again, kind of one or two key systemic improvements and drivers of engagement satisfaction across the organization. Let's go to the next page. Uh, we, we talked about the engagement and satisfaction uh, work that we've done on the employee side. We certainly do a lot of other services as well. Uh, again, aligned to the Baldrige criteria, whether that's new hire surveys or exit interviews, uh, on the customer side, customer loyalty and satisfaction surveys, customer interviews and customer focus groups, uh, a lot of different elements like that. And uh, as I mentioned, we are honored to, uh, to have been a longtime partner with the Baldrige Foundation and uh, you know, give back a portion of our revenues back to the foundation to continue to promote uh, process and performance excellence throughout uh, the country. Now, uh, but before I close up here, I, we're kind of a practical group and, and we like to give uh, clients kind of real takeaways. So, so let me give the leaders that are on the call here today um, three practical applications that you can take away to improve employee engagement at your organization. This is from uh, hundreds of thousands of employees that, that we've uh, gotten feedback from across a wide variety of industries, certainly many of our Baldrige clients, but, but other clients as well. 
So what, what can I do as a leader if I want to improve engagement in my organization? And again, these are going to be broad strokes, but, but three key things. Number one is going to be communicate. Uh, and and, and th that, that's the what, that, that's the easy part, but the how is really the important part. But when you, when you communicate, you really need to break this down into three things. Number one, I, I have to be able to answer these three questions. Number one, what do I want people to know about my communication? Number two, what do I want them to feel? Because we know that they're not just going to act totally off of rational data. We, we need them to feel something. The emotions are what really move them to something. So what do I want them to feel? And then number three, what do I want them to ultimately do? If I can't define it and they can't define it, they're not going to do it. So what do I want people to know? What do I want them to feel? And what do I want them to do? Th those are the three key things when you communicate to, to really work on and, and think about. And, and here's a big thought. You're never just communicating. You're always leading, right? And, and the, the two important qualities that, that you have to have in your communication is certainly confidence. I, I think as leaders, you, know, you certainly probably already have that. Uh, but you also have to have kind of humility in that as well. And you know, we all tend to impress uh, others with our strengths, but we really connect to them through our weaknesses and our vulnerabilities. So be, be open to kind of using that as a way to connect. And remember that, that, that employees will always follow a leader who's always real over one that's always right. And, and so be real with them and, and help them to connect. So communication, number one. Uh, number two item, uh, if you really want to improve engagement, continuously develop your leaders. As a leader, I think this is the most important thing that you can do. They all want to be led to, to something bigger than themselves. When your leaders get better, the whole organization gets better. Uh, be deliberate about this. Build a systematic and, and continuous plan of improving the leadership skills of your managers, supervisors, and leaders. That's going to have an exponential impact on your organization. And then number three, uh, collaborate and connect the dots across your work systems. So we said communicate continuously develop leaders and collaborate and connect the dots across your work systems. Employees get frustrated by the service and quality gaps that they see that you may not be close enough to observe. Uh, as the Baldrige framework outlines, uh, building an integrated and systematic way of connecting your leadership framework to your employee experience, to your operational processes, to your customer experience, to your performance outcomes is a, to, is a key to creating uh, value for your employees and your customers. It's true at a macro level, at a total organizational level, and it's also true at a micro level across departments and organizational silos. So really work to eliminate those gaps and, and you'll see improvements in your engagement with your employees. So communicate, continuously develop, collaborate and connect those dots across the silos of your organization. Those are three key takeaways that, that you can certainly apply uh, to your organization. And uh, last slide, if you want to know more about us or about uh, this whole employee engagement satisfaction uh, work that we've been doing, uh, if you go to the next slide, you can go to uh, baldridgealigned.com and you'll see some information out there that will uh, we actually have some de live demos out there that you can play with and, and uh, explore. Uh, you can also uh, feel free to reach out directly to me. Uh, I am the, the person that works with all of our clients that are on the Baldrige journey and would be honored to uh, connect with you and, uh, and talk more about uh, you, you know, what, what we can do. But, but even if it's just to get some advice on, on what you need to do, we're not here just to sell surveys. We're here to really be a partner with the community and, and to help and uh, would, would be honored and glad to talk with you. And with that, uh, I'll open it up for any questions that we may have. Well, our first question well, I can actually question, answer, can... and it was asked twice, and that is, will the slides and the presentation be available after the webinar? And the answer is yes, by tomorrow, that'll be posted. Uh, a live recording will be posted on our website along with the slides so that you can preview it or show it to others. Uh, our second question, George, is uh, in a typical engagement, what is the average timeline from beginning with you to seeing results? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, it typically takes us about 30 days to, to set up. So if, if we were to say, hey, George, I love everything I heard. Uh, let's do it. it. It would be about 30 days from today. We would be ready to launch that survey with your entire workforce. Um, once we launch it, we typically leave it open for two weeks, a two week period. Once we close the survey, as I mentioned, we get all the results to you in those online dashboards within five business days of the close of the survey. 
And then our teams work where we go through and we build a PowerPoint deck of our analysis and recommendations. That takes 15 business days from the close of the survey. So about three weeks after the close of the survey, we have all that PowerPoint data available to you. Uh, one week after the survey, we have the uh, dashboard, uh, you know, all the data visible in, in that, that interactive dashboard for you. And then the manager dashboards, we, we typically deploy those after we've met with the leadership team and kind of gone through the high level results. You know, deploy those manager dashboards uh, on your timeline then uh, when you're ready uh, after that meeting. Next question is, with the employee focus group sessions and the managed active planning workshops and the leader action planning facilitation, do you con and conduct those or do you train trainers and, and how does that process work? Yeah, it's, a, it's another great question. Um, and, and the answer is all of the above. So, so for organizations that don't feel like they have that capability or skill, um, we can certainly come in and facilitate that process and, and we do facilitate that process for them. For, for those that, that say, you know, we have some people here that we'd like to learn that skill, then, then we can sort of do that the first time around and have them shadow us and learn and sort of train the trainer type of a model. And then they can be self-sustaining uh, from that point. And then we have other organizations. Midway USA is certainly an example of that, uh, that, that they have great capabilities internally. They've got lots of discipline around their processes around that. And, and they've been doing that for years and years. And, and they do that entirely by themselves. So when, when I mentioned earlier on kind of customized approach, that, that certainly applies to the survey design and the reporting. It also applies to the process of how we work with our clients. For different clients, uh, they have different needs and, and we're here to, to kind of meet those needs. We, we don't we don't force something on you that, that you're not interested in, uh, but we're also here to support you if you do need some additional help. Next question is, how well does this work for an organization that's small? Let's say. Al, I, mi I missed the, the number that I think you were going to share at the end there. Um, but it, it's worked oh, it very was well. 50 for employees. 50 employees. Okay. Yeah, it, we, we've, we've used this with uh, organizations as small as 70 employees has, has been our smallest so far, and it worked just fine. Um, we, we do make a few modifications in how we do the reporting. Uh, typically, uh, our normal approach is that we will allow you to, uh, to uh, segment down to groups of, of where there's at least five employees in a group. Um, with, with those organizations that are under about 150 employees, we'll work with your team to, to define w what is the appropriate level. We, we've never gone below three, um, so, so, so three employees in a group to, to build a segment. Uh, and that's really there just to protect the anonymity of those employees. We don't want to expose you know, an individual employee's response um, to, to, uh, to their leadership. But, uh, but that, that's really the, the only variance that we've seen in, from a process perspective is just how deeply can we go into the reporting. Um, and again, we, we kind of work with you to make some modifications, adjustments there. But uh, I think it's been you know, as effective for those smaller organizations uh, many of the uh, organ procurement organizations around the country, uh, which tend to be a little bit smaller organizations, 150 less or less employees, um, have, have used this model and, and uh, have been real successful with it. Our next question is, what is the methodology utilized to determine the key drivers and the correlating impact that they generate? Yeah, great, great question. Um, we actually uh, do two different aspects to that because um, we're kind of analytical geeks here, if you will. Uh, the, the first aspect it was really originated again through that uh, Midway USA methodology of um, identifying the weightings of the various key requirements. So it's an employee driven or an employee centric uh, methodology to how we calculate those drivers. Uh, the employees actually define for themselves. Here's the weighting I would apply to this item. And then in aggregate, as you roll all those weightings up across the organization, you start to get to what are the key drivers. Now, now separate and apart from that, what we've done, and this is some of the refinements that we've made with organizations like Mid-America Transplant, um, is to say, you know, that, that weighting is great, that, that that's helpful, but let's kind of validate that secondarily using some regression modeling to, to, to connect the, the way that they're scoring the various questions to their overall level of satisfaction engagement. So 
We do some uh, nonlinear regression modeling to, to get to that driver analysis as a secondary methodology as well uh, to, to understand you know, what are those key drivers or at least to validate those key drivers. The last question that we have time for is, do you see the use of artificial intelligence changing employee engagement surveys in the future? Wow, I think I think that's a brilliant question. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 you know, what, what we are very interested in kind of the, the edges of what can be done in this space. Um, certainly, there's lots that we're doing already around kind of predictive analytics and and uh, you know more kind of traditional analytic tools. Uh, but but we think there's a lot that can be done when we start to take not just survey data, but we start to take behavioral data that, that can be collected around the organization. And, and start to connect those kind of real-time operational things that are going on to level of engagement, right? And, and let me give you a couple quick examples. Uh, so throughout your organization today, there's probably a number of different metrics of productivity or absenteeism or attendance or things like that. Sort of taking those and starting to think of those as leading indicators of engagement um, and predictors of kind of employee behavior um, and starting to model those into some kind of forward-thinking models. So, I think it's a brilliant question. It's, it's probably way too big for me to unpack in, in the couple minutes I have here, but uh, whoever asked that, I'd love to talk to you more about that. Um, it, it's kind of where our head is at in the future. Uh, today, I think lots of organizations are still very much tied to a survey and, and getting that feedback, and it's certainly a very valid uh, approach to, to it. Uh, but, but there's certainly some, some interesting things that are kind of on the horizon with all of the kind of big data and, and people analytics work that's been going on inside of uh, a lot of organizations. Yeah, there's your contact information to continue that discussion. And you can also connect to George and Beyond Feedback from the Baldrige Foundation website. Uh, George, on behalf of the entire Baldrige community, once again, thank you very much for today's presentation. It was extremely interesting and engaging. Thank you. We're going to now give you a quick update on the Baldrige Foundation and what is happening in the areas of advocacy, fundraising, and foundation operations around the Baldrige Enterprise. Uh, the first thing that I would like to talk to is the budget and the budget process. Uh, there is, once again, $2.2 million appropriated for the Baldrige program in the 2020 budget, which is currently being worked in Congress, but both the House and the Senate are very supportive of that appropriation, and we fully expect it to reach the president's desk and then from the president to be turned back to Congress in February of next year. We continue to look for opportunities around the entire Baldrige enterprise to engage members of Congress, especially in their states and state with state programs. As you can see, we do track closely uh, the key members of the U.S. Commerce Justice Science Subcommittee in the Senate and both in the House to ensure that we are maintaining strong relationships across both of those key subcommittees, especially in places like Alabama, where we have the ranking member, Bob Adderholt, and the chair of the full Appropriations Committee, Senator Richard Shelby. And then in Kansas with Senator Jerry Moran, and then also in New Hampshire with Senator Shaheen and in New York with the chair of the House Committee subcommittee, Senator or Congressman Jose Serrano. If you have a relationship with a member of Congress, regardless of whether or not they're on one of these subcommittees, it would be very helpful if you could persuade them to contact members of the subcommittee and show their support for the Baldrige program. In addition to that, we continue to work on engaging the President of the United States to recognize award recipients. Uh, we've made some progress this year to get a little bit closer to the White House staff who does feel that the messaging aligns with the President's goals and objectives and the administration's. And so we are working on hopefully getting the President to re-engage with Baldridge. Nothing could help us more in terms of not just recognizing award recipients, but also raising awareness for the program. Uh, there's a new white paper published by the Baldridge Foundation that is currently on our website that you can download, and it is the oversight of organizational performance management for boards of directors. 
This is going to be used also by the National Association of Corporate Directors, who we are now partnering with, to try to bring oversight of performance management using Baldrige-based tools, whether they be the Excellence Builder or the full criteria itself. George Benson, the chair of the board of directors of the foundation, authored personally this oversight of organizational performance management, and it is a great read. It's especially instructive and helpful for not only uh, members of boards of directors, but also for chief executive officers and C-suite members who are looking to strengthen their board engagement in their Baldridge journey. We continue to fundraise with the Alliance for Performance Excellence to support them in every way possible. Last year, we raised 83% of their support for their fall conference in Denver. This year's conference is 24 and 25 October in Nashville. And we are again uh, supporting that with sponsors and uh, people who will uh, help support performance excellence in that venue. In in terms of fundraising for the foundation, I'd like to once again bring the attention of Amazon Smiles to everybody. Uh, simply choose Amazon and then Amazon Smile. We have an instructive video that you can see here, the screenshot on the bottom of the slide where you can go on and learn how to use Amazon Smile. And what it does is a percentage of every dollar that you spend comes to the Baldrige Foundation once you choose us as your selected charity. It does not cost you anything to do this. Bald or Amazon simply does that out of their corporate stewardship uh, helping charities around the country. We continue to partner with the SOAR Vision Group to present CEO Innovation Roundtable events. In 2019, we just held our most recent one, uh, 6th and 7th June in Atlanta for nonprofit healthcare CEOs and board chairs. It was an extremely successful event that attracted a number of people to Baldridge for the first time. In addition to that, the Manufacturing CEO Innovation Roundtable will take place in Cleveland, Ohio on October the 15th. And our Rural Healthcare CEO Innovation Roundtable will be at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, in Birmingham, Alabama, on the 6th and 7th of November. I would encourage everybody to go to the SOAR Vision Group or Baldridge websites and link to the Foundation's radio show along with SOAR Vision Group, our partner, Leader Dialogue Radio. We have an associated website with blogs and you can download each of the presentations off front, which take place each Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, but you can download them as podcasts, load them on your phone, listen to them while you're in the air flying somewhere or any other time if you're out running or walking, you can listen to these uh, exciting shows. The most recent one last Friday was conducted with Lowell Cruz, who's not only a member of the Foundation Board of Directors, but he is also the chair of Communities of Excellence 2026 and the former CEO of Heartland Health, a National Award Baldridge recipient. Very exciting show, would recommend that you download it and give it a listen. The Foundation Leadership Awards. Last year, as you can see on the right, we had a stellar group of award recipients. I would encourage everyone, because there are great leaders in each of your organizations, I would encourage each of you to take the time to simply download the form, which is a very simple form, and nominate somebody for one of these awards. We continue to recognize those people around the Baldrige community who continue with passion and dedication and determination to not only grow Baldridge, but to strengthen it around the country. At this time, I'm going to turn over the presentation to the director of the Baldridge Performance Excellence Program, Bob Fangmeyer. Bob? Thanks, Al. Uh, good afternoon, or perhaps good morning, everybody. Uh, it's great to be with you. Um, we have a uh, quick update here. I will try and be um, pretty quick because we're a little tight on time and I have quite a few things I'd like to share with you. Um, if my slides will move here, hold on one second. Jerry, I'm struggling here, brother. There we go. All right. 
So I'd like to start with just giving an update real quick on some of the things that are happening right now. Um, these are our current priorities above the line or sort of those things that are operational below the line are things that are more our strategic imperatives and strategic initiatives uh, that we're focused on. And of course, throughout the year, we're constantly going through a process to evaluate and improve our various uh, activities and offerings. And right now we're focused on our quest and ceremony and examiner training, both of which have been completed for the year. We're also focused on the award process right now as we evaluate the applicants for this year's award program. The fellows program is uh, alive and well doing uh, very, going very strongly. And um, matter of fact, I just got back late last night uh, from a visit uh, with a couple of our award recipients uh, out in the Midwest with uh, Mid-America Transplant and Honeywell FMNT, along with special guest, uh, Sister Mary Jean Ryan from SSM. We're also involved in developing the case study for our examiner training and for, uh, as an example, for applicants for 2020. And as always seems to be the case, we have a number of uh, mandatory changes and updates to our website and IT systems that are required that are taking up a significant amount of our time and energy. The strategic initiatives uh, are listed below. I'm gonna touch on a couple of those in a few minutes, so I won't say much else at, at this point in time. So this chart shows our net promoter scores for areas related to the mortgage framework and the award process. We have been using net promoter score for the past nine years. And if you step back and take a look, you can see that each of these areas has a significant positive trend over those past nine years. Furthermore, all of our offerings at this point um, are scoring above a 50, which as probably most of you know, is considered excellent in the net promoter arena. Some that aren't listed here, uh, but we also track, relate to our examiner training, which scores normally around 60 every year. The Quest for Excellence Conference itself, which scores around 70. And the Baldrige Fellows Program, which scores between 80 to 100 every single year. With regards to our examiner training, uh, this year we trained 384 examiners. You can see the breakdown of those types of examiners. Um, obviously, we really would like to increase the number of senior examiners. If you see that number 44, that's a little bit lower than we would want. We'd like to have a more even balance between our new returning and senior examiners. One significant change this year was the sort of recreation of what used to be called the alumni examiner. Alumni examiners were originally established to be essentially a swing pool of folks with significant expertise that we could use to put on a team in an area of need, particularly if someone happened to drop off of the team. There were some unintended consequences of that, and so we decided that we needed to uh, sort of reformulate that approach. And the master examiners now have a different primary responsibility. It's not to strictly be a swing pool. It is instead to help us make sure that we have sufficient folks out there who are mentoring, coaching, uh, and helping to develop other examiners. So that is their primary role and responsibility uh, in addition to other aspects that a team leader may need them to participate in. 2019 award applicants, we have 26 this year. And on the right-hand side, you can see the breakdown, 16 healthcare, five nonprofit, three small business, one education, and one service organization. In the parentheses next to those, you can see the 2018 numbers. Obviously, uh, 26 does not hit our target of 30. We are still striving to uh, move those numbers up a bit. And just looking at the breakdown, clearly where we need to make the most progress is with our business applicants. And so we continue to work to increase those numbers. Okay, as far as some of our strategic initiatives, the award process redesign. Uh, many of you have probably heard me speak about this before. We have been working towards this over the past couple of years. We want to make sure 
that folks understand that this effort is not an indictment of the current process. The process is proven to be effective at identifying role model organizations and providing extremely valuable feedback to those award applicant organizations. However, if you participated in the process, I think you would agree that there would appear to be opportunities to streamline the process and make it a little more efficient. So our goal here, our objective is to increase the efficiency, increase the value, but maintain the effectiveness, which means the integrity and the rigor of the award process. We also hope to reduce the cycle time to better utilize our examiner resources, enhance the value to the applicants as well as to the examiners who participate and improve timeliness, clarity, transparency, and the quality of the feedback that the applicants receive. We believe we're making good progress in this regard. Last year, we ran a pilot. Uh, there has been a state program that has run a couple of pilots. This summer, we are running additional pilots as are other state programs. Um, all of those have gone very well. The feedback we've received has been extremely positive from all parties. This past uh, June, early June, we had our judges take a deep dive into the proposed changes and what that might mean for their processes. We wanted to make sure that it would not be problematic from their perspective regarding their responsibilities and the outcome was that they fully support the proposed changes. We are also looking towards the future beyond changes to the evaluation side of the house uh, to what we're calling phase two of the redesign effort to make sure that we take a close look at the application process as well. So we're looking at what we might need to create or purchase uh, in order to develop or provide an integrated application and evaluation tool where everybody would work online, including the applicants. Okay, assuming that the pilots continue to provide favorable feedback, um, we anticipate nailing this down in terms of the process changes this fall. Then we're going to take a year while we manage the current process, we will also update all of the systems, subsystems, documentation, guidance, et cetera, that's needed in order to go live with the changes in 2021. Cybersecurity is something we've been involved in for a few years now out of a desire to help address a national need as well as introduce new individuals and organizations to Baldrige. Currently, some of the things we've been working on include the update to the Cybersecurity Excellence Builder. We released version 1.1 in March, and that was changed based on the changes to the Baldrige framework, as well as the changes to the NIST Cybersecurity framework and uh, changes and in inputs from various uh, subject matter experts. A number of other things going on with cyber, including a number of presentations uh, to organizations that might be interested in using it with um, the organizations that they work with. The Gartner client uh, presentation was just last week, uh, where 600 or so Gartner's clients uh, were introduced to the Baldrige Cybersecurity Excellence Building. Workforce Development Excellence is an outgrowth of an executive order that established the National Council for the American Worker. And among the things that they've been chartered to do is to recognize companies that demonstrate excellence in workplace education, training, and retraining, and to identify and adopt best practices, share those best practices with other organizations. And of course, that sounds very similar to our mission. And we were invited. In fact, we were required to participate in this. And uh, happily, we are striving to create a new award uh, that would be aligned with Baldridge to the extent that we would be able to uh, leverage it in terms of helping to address a national need and again, introduce more individuals and organizations to Baldridge at the same time. I mentioned the fellows. These are just a few quotes ongoing. The fellows program has been extremely successful and uh, we look forward to uh, continuing this uh, leadership development program. Um, if you didn't get a chance to see it, there is a fantastic blog uh, from last week, last Thursday on our website, 
highlighting one of the fellows from a few years back and his creation of an innovative clinical institute within his organization. I strongly encourage you to go check out Blogridge and read that article. That's all I have for you, and I look forward to any questions you may have. Uh, we don't have any more questions, but we do have a couple of more things that we would like to talk about here. And if we can get the right slide, there we go. So Brian Lasseter is unable to make it today, so I'm going to go through his two slides. The first one here is that the Alliance programs, as you all know, are the gateway to performance excellence in each of the states. I just had the opportunity to visit one of the best state programs in the country out there in Texas earlier this week and see their two newest highest award recipients, the city of El Paso, Texas, which the city manager is Tommy Gonzalez, which many of you will remember, was also the city manager at the city of Irving, Texas, when they were a Ma Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award recipient. The other one was from Natchitoches Regional Medical Center, a rural hospital in Louisiana, because Texas, like a few other contiguous states around Louisiana, is helping them with their performance excellence efforts. So congratulations to those two organizations, to the state of Texas, and also to New Mexico and Colorado state programs where I was at their conferences. Uh, a quick update on the Alliance and some of their activities that are currently taking place right now. First of all, the planning for the 2019 Bald Baldridge Fall Conference continues. They've recently solidified the agenda, which should be out shortly. It will be held the 24th and 25th at the Gaylord in Nashville, Tennessee, a great place to uh, spend the weekend, which would be the 26th and the 27th, and their conference rate extends beyond the weekend as well. Uh, the program is 90% complete uh, with a lineup of super great speakers. They have sponsorship opportunities available. You can contact the foundation if you would like to sponsor a particular event or the conference overall itself. And the registration is currently open at baldridgeconference.org. They continue to work on a strategic task force for the guidelines for low level of tiered awards, trying to standardize those lower level tiered awards throughout the entire Alliance for Performance Excellence in all of our state programs. And they've launched a second task force to collaborate with Communities of Excellence 2026 to support their program. Texas also recognized the city of El Paso as their first state level, state level COE 2026 award recipient. In addition to that, they're collaborating with the Baldridge Enterprise on a few of the task forces that we have running between the entire enterprise, the foundation, the program, the alliance, and ASQ. And those are identifying marketing opportunities to grow Baldridge, specifically in the manufacturing sector, and then also to standardize training around the country. So that concludes today's Baldridge Foundation quarterly webinar series. I want to thank all of our donors out there who continue to support the program as well as support the foundation and the alliance and especially the Baldridge family who once again supported the foundation this year by sponsoring the award ceremony in Washington, DC. Thanks again for your participation. And again, as a reminder, the slides and the recording will be available on our website starting tomorrow. Thank you and have a great summer.